Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Galuli, Vice Chair of DLA Piper. And on behalf of my co-panelists and other colleagues at the firm, I'd like to welcome you to our discussion today. We've assembled a great panel for you and we have a lot of material to cover. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna introduce them quickly, but I encourage you to read their full bios at dlapiper.com. Danny Toby is a partner with the firm and also a medical doctor. Danny represents life science, technology and healthcare clients in regulatory and litigation matters. Danny's a widely recognized and sought after AI and medical thought leader and co-leads our AI and data, data analytics practice. Bennett Borden is a partner in DLA Piper's chief data scientist. His practice includes AI and algorithm verification and related services. Bennett was formerly a data scientist with the Central Intelligence Agency and together with Danny co-leads our AI and data analytics practice. Brooke Goodlett is an up counsel who heads our legal data services team. Her team provides clients and other stakeholders with advanced data analytics and benchmarking related to governance, public reporting, ESG, and other corporate matters. In today's session, we'll cover a range of topics, including an overview of the numerous domestic and foreign efforts underway to both apply existing regulations and to develop new regulations related to the development and use of AI. We'll also discuss trends in public and private litigation and enforcement, and then we'll have a discussion of how we expect current governance, compliance, risk management, and public reporting practices to evolve as AI becomes more pervasive across companies and industries. And if time allows, we'll close with a Q&A session. In addition to this webinar, we have available on our website a white paper called Regulatory Litigation and Disclosure Considerations Concerning Artificial Intelligence, and I encourage you to download and read it. So with that done, let's get started. And I'll turn the call over now to Danny and Bennett. Thank you. Thanks, John. Next slide, please. Uh, nice to be with everyone uh, this afternoon and this morning. Um, this is a topic of, of a tremendous interest lately, and it seems like every day, uh, more or less, there are new regulatory uh, statements, uh, letters, proposals uh, to try to get a handle on a technology that is moving faster than I think anyone predicted. Uh, there has been such a leap in technology over the last year and six months with generative AI and general purpose AI, and we'll promise to talk about what, what all those things mean, uh, that legislative and regulatory efforts that have been in the works for months or years are suddenly uh, uh, seem quaint and and are being rethought uh, rapidly uh, and 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 with a great deal of determination. So, what can we as lawyers and advisors do in a situation like this, which uh, uh, may be fair to say is unprecedented in the speed of evolution of the technology and the regulatory interest around it? Uh, Bennett and I think about this problem every day and uh, are, are fortunate to work with some of the folks who are really uh, where the rubber meet the road on these issues. And, and Ben and I like to say it, it's great to say that AI should be fair and that it should be explainable and uh, not biased. Th those are all really important and and uh, uncontroversial goals for, for regulators and, and for innovators. Uh, th the problem is what, what do those terms mean? And, and what do they mean when you as a company or you as a regulator have to actually translate them into the language of this regulated product, which is math? Uh, and what fairness or bias may mean in one regulatory vertical, say healthcare is very different than what it may mean in uh, insurance or employment, uh, both because of societal values and because of existing regulations that have def different definitions of, of acceptable harm and acceptable risk and benefit. Uh, so th these are, at a high level, some of the issues that all of these regulators around the world are wrestling with. And um, there, there's no uh, disparagement to say uh, uh, that fairness uh, is a tough goal. Uh, it, it's a really important goal, and it's something we, we take very seriously. Um, the challenge is just what comes next. 
and, and I think that's what we'll talk about today. Um, there are regulations pending that are sector specific and that are uh, what is referred to as horizontal, meaning they attempt to regulate AI as a technology across all industries. Um, and sometimes they're hybrids. So we'll walk you through some of those efforts. Uh, and um, because this is changing so quickly, what we're gonna try to do is simplify and share what we see as the common themes uh, of, of these efforts uh, to try and uh, help people get some ground beneath their feet in this area. So next slide, please, Ben. So if you look backwards, uh, AI regulatory efforts have really focused on three things. Um, that's the role of AI in uh, what, what some would refer to as fundamental rights. Um, but you know, more, more simply put, AI that's really affecting people's lives uh, in, in important ways. Can they get a job? Can they get healthcare? Uh, can they get insurance? Um, how will they be treated in society? Access to, to housing, um, all, all critical fundamental issues that uh, to some extent are already being ceded to algorithms in, in some context. Uh, a, a second bucket of regulatory focus has been on trying to understand the tools themselves. So uh, imposing regulations that require AI to be transparent or explainable. And we'll, we'll talk about what those terms mean and, and what's realistic uh, to expect uh, in, in that respect. Um, and then the third major bucket to date is algorithmic discrimination. And uh, if uh, discrimination is the original sin of human society, uh, it infuses our data. And AI is only as good as the data that trains it. Uh, and it's only as good as the models and the assumptions of those models, which are also uh, designed by imperfect people. Um, but AI is unique in its scale and its speed and its scope in terms of learning from past discrimination in the wrong sense of the word um, and drawing the wrong conclusions and then paying them forward. Um, where regulation is going, we'll also talk about, uh, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more emphasis on safety and, and critical issues of product liability uh, and, and uh, fundamental safety of these systems with, with unexpected properties. Uh, and access to increasingly critical infrastructure. Um, so we'll talk about that as well, uh, because we're starting to see a shift in regulatory focus towards, towards that lens. So next slide, please. So how do leaders, and, and by this we mean leaders of countries, uh, uh, leaders of companies adopting AI and, and leaders of companies making AI, how do they react to a rapidly changing, overlapping, somewhat inconsistent and uh, imprecise uh, regulatory landscape, uh, and then the litigation and reputational risk that is evolving in tandem. Um, we will talk about that uh, first from the perspective of providing just a basic education, um, taking nothing for granted uh, and recognizing the variety of people watching today. And then it's gonna take us through starting at, at square one, uh, what do these terms mean and how do they work? Uh, and then we're gonna talk about new expectations for data science literacy. Um, one of the things the most recent efforts at regulation are highlighting is that it's we're on notice. Uh, it, it, it's no longer uh, possible to say, I didn't know, I didn't know AI could discriminate, or I, I don't understand what that means. Uh, so things like NIST framework and others say, these are issues that require board level literacy and education. Um, and so that's uh, just a, we'll, we'll hope to provide just the beginnings of that today. So with that, I will turn it over to Bennett to um, lay the foundation of what we're talking about. Thanks, Danny. So we thought we'd start at the beginning. Um, as this next slide shows, we want to talk about AI and automated decision making systems and how they work. How do they work well? How do they work? How do problems arise from them? 
because you don't really need to be a data scientist to understand where risks can come from. And especially we as legal counselors or people who are responsible for risk management at companies, we, that's what we need to understand is where these risks can come from so that you can ask the right questions and have the right governance framework around where those risks might come from. So let's start with some level setting. So the next slide, we're gonna use the term AI, algorithmic decision-making, automated decision-making algorithms um, kind of interchangeably. The data science community um, is more precise than that, of course. So AI is very difficult to uh, define, but it usually means a computer system or set of commands that whose output is kind of the level of a, of a human being, right? It's a human being intelligence, but made artificially. But most of the systems that we deal with out in the world and that are in use around the world in most companies are not true AI. They're really algorithms. And so next slide, Ben. An algorithm is a set of rules that move usually a person or a, a, a piece of data, whether that data is a person or an application or something, and it moves it through a series of rules to come out with an answer. Um, it's almost like a Plinko machine. So when you go online and you apply for a mortgage or a credit card or an insurance policy, you fill out this information, you hit a button, and the algorithm then takes all that information and spits out an answer. I should give you this mortgage at this rate for this number of years or an insurance policy at this premium class. Um, you should get moved into the from the resume pile to the interview pile. But fundamentally what they're doing is finding commonalities among the group and the members of the group and putting you in a group that they can make decisions on. Because what that's what we're trying to do is trying to get to an answer by putting you in a group or putting in either a person or a piece of data in a group so we can make decisions about those people. So. Next slide, artificial intelligence is just real old smart algorithms, right? For the most part, we'll talk about generative AI separately because it's a, it is a revolutionarily different technology. But so we hear about general AI, um, which has always been um, a hope and dream um, as opposed to narrow AI, which predicts a specific answer. It has one job that it tries to spit out one answer. Whereas general AI, which is what we're kind of approaching with generative AI, is it can do a bunch of different things. Um, but it's not really in use much in the world outside of governments and things like that. So the only other term I want you to be aware of is machine learning. So machine learning is where there's a feedback loop to how it got the answer right or wrong. So typically, um, so think like recommendation engines, like so Netflix or any other streaming service or Amazon's, um, hey, you might like this because you bought that, or those are all, they have feedback mechanism. So if they say, hey, you might like this show and you click on that show, it gets a thumbs up and it thinks it got it right. If you don't, or if you straight out don't like it, that's a feedback mechanism. So machine learning just means there's some way for the algorithm or AI system to get feedback on how it's doing. So how do these actually work? Let's go a little bit more detail about how algorithms work. Like I said, it really comes down to, can I put people in a group? And we're going to work with people mostly because that's where most of the regulated interest is, right? When I take information about a person and I give them some kind of either economic benefit or opportunity, um, they get it. A, uh, a job interview or a credit card or all those things, right? So that because most of the regulation is around how do these systems touch on people, that's what we're going to talk mostly about. So it identifies characteristics about a person, puts that person in the group that's closest to what um, you're looking for. Like all these people kind of have the same characteristics. They're all going to like, you know, Dark Water or Marvel comics or whatever it is, right? Um, they're going to then react to this. Um, email or social media post, all of those things are these recommender issue, uh, recommendation engines where we put people in a group and said, hey, you're like those. 
and then action is taken on that group membership. So what are some of these questions that we're trying to figure out about these people? Um, so the examples of characteristics that certain industries care about. So think insurance, right? How likely is you're gonna get sick or hurt or die or break something, right? And how can I, what is the amount I should charge to cover that risk? Same with financial services, it's a risk thing. Employment, why don't we start getting into different characteristics? Like what characteristics can I find out about you that makes you a fit for the job? Healthcare is a different question. Um, cybersecurity, are you who you say you are? And fraud, are you who you say you are? And are you up to no good? So you can see each of these industries and many others, they kind of have a raison d'etre, right? Like we're trying to figure out this thing. And so we build a model to see if we can predict that thing. Okay, so that's how most of these algorithmic systems that almost every company in the world uses are these kind of algorithmic um, decision-making systems. So let me just touch on generative AI here for a minute because it is a different kind of animal. So generative AI, basically it's a really complicated algorithm and neural net really, that is trying to figure out what the next best word is. So for example, um, if I write the sentence, the best thing about AI is its ability to, well, here's the words that these models spit out. Learn, predict, make, understand, do. And every time the next word goes in, it runs these calculations again and says, okay, well, what's the next word? And actually this, this reference here at the bottom, Stephen Wolf from what is Jet, chat GPT doing and why does it work is one of the best articles. It's long, it's kind of a big long blog post. It's technical, but not, you don't need a really technical background. It can really explain what it is that generative AI is doing. And so it's different than classifying people or attributes into a group and making decisions on them. It's actually creating content. But the weird thing is it actually doesn't understand the meaning of the words that it's putting out. So for instance, uh, this is what you'll hear that it hallucinates, which is a really nice way of saying it straight up lies, right? And so. Uh, for example, someone said, hey, write a positive review of the fire Festival. Here it is. I attended this thing. It was so great and so awesome. But the fire Festival never actually existed. So this is why it can lie. And it just, or hallucinate, we'll use hallucinate. Uh, but it does so not just with text, but with pictures, right? Which is part of the fun. So generative AI can take these prompts that we're putting in, like write a positive review of fire Festival, or like the next slide shows, Hey, I want you to make this uh, make a, a picture of a stuffed animal in the shape of a Greek philosopher wearing a VR headset. This is what I came up with. This isn't real. This isn't real life. And sure, everybody knows that a stuffed animal wearing a VR headset probably is not um, a real life thing. But then we get into things like the Pope and the puppy coat. Um, and so, just as with text pictures can lie, meaning what they're portraying is not actually true. So keep these two things in mind. We'll talk about why both of these are, are important. So these algorithmic systems that, that focus on a characteristic and make decisions based on that characteristic or set of characteristics, that is one area of concern and how do you find risk. Generative AI is kind of a whole new thing. Um, and so we'll talk about how do problems arise in both of those contexts. So this gets us into understanding algorithmic bias. Now, it's important that we that the real uh, definition of the word bias is just inaccuracy. I don't mean bias in the way that we sometimes use it in labor and employment law or disparate impact, right? Um, bias just simply means it's an inaccurate view of the truth. Well, here's the thing, every model is an inaccurate view of the truth. We can't, we don't have all the data or the computing power to actually model real life in its entirety. And so there's a famous saying in data science that says all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. What we're trying to do is simplify the world by building a model of what I'm looking for. And that is how I do that is more or less accurate. And it's the inaccuracy or bias that we start to have problems. And there's really three places where that bias can come in. One is the data that it's based upon. 
So every model learns from the data that it's based on. For example, one in my office downstairs, there's a CVS pharmacy. And I go in in the afternoons and I usually get, you know, a Diet Coke. But then, of course, a very healthy, like, candy bar or Reese bar, because that's clearly what I prefer. Uh, but so CVS is not really smart. Every time I go, they spit out a coupon or they'll ping my little app and say, oh, you may be going down there soon. Here's a coupon for you. The reason why it knows to do that is not just because of my behavior, but it puts me in a group with all these other people. And all those people have data points that it builds this model off of. So it can be the data that it's based on because all it sees is this is the truth. Whatever you feed me, that's what I understand to be the truth. The other is the inner workings of the model. Like how does it actually weight stuff? How does it actually work to spit out the answer? Believe it or not, that's not typically where the problem comes in. Um, these things work really well based on what you give and what you're trying to do with it. But the, the inner workings can be an issue. But really the other is, is the output. So very often we make conclusions based on an output of an algorithmic system. And it's that decision-making process and that application layer, when I'm applying an insight, that's where we often see, and it's the most dangerous because that's where you're typically hitting a consumer or other um, kind of regulated interest. So let's go through these a little bit. Um, the one you hear a lot about is kind of the proxy effect or proxy discrimination. So let me tell you what that means. Let's say I'm trying to write a model to figure out who's going to be, it's like a labor and employment, an HR model. And either I'm combing through resumes to find who I should hire, who's the best fit for a job, or even internally, like who's who should I recommend for this executive training or something like that, right? I can't just walk up to someone and point a little thing and get, think, hey, tell me what your score is for this. I have to find pieces of information or data that have the signal I'm looking for, the signal being a, a good fit for the job or good performance fit. So I look at things like years of education, college attendance, job history, the number of degrees or kind of degrees, your participation in volunteer activities, all of which carry this signal, this yellow bar that I am looking for. But the problem is every data variable also carries a bunch of other signals. And that is what this proxy effect is. So what's interesting is if you look down this list from years of education down to volunteer activities, what you're picking up is this blue signal, which is a gender signal that's intertwined with my target signal. So years of education, college, job history, degrees, as I go farther down here, I'm picking up more and more of an unintended gender signal. So it's important to really understand what variables you're using and what you're trying to get out of them and what other signal, maybe the noise may be coming in there. And how do you measure that and how do you uh, mitigate that? And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that technically. But when people talk about the proxy effect, this is what they're talking about. So the next slide is another very common problem. And this is the data that I bring in is already biased upon collection. So before I get into this specific example, I'll tell you this is one of my favorite ones. So Normally, when we do this live, we ask the question, um, guess what one of the top selling products is at Walmart before a hurricane? And people say it's batteries or water, flashlights. One of the always at the top is strawberry Pop-Tarts. And it's strawberry Pop-Tarts more than any other Pop-Tart. Well, uh, you could look at that data and say, look, every time there's a spike in strawberry Pop-Tart sales, there's then a spike, there's a hurricane. Well. That means that strawberry Pop-Tarts cause hurricanes. Well, of course they don't, right? But that gets us into, when I'm drawing conclusions about the world, we do that all the time. We find these correlations between events or between kinds of data, and we, we want to put a conclusion on there that just doesn't hold up. On this side, and this is really common in what regulators are concerned about, 
So here's the story. So Boston, many years ago, the Department of Transportation teamed up with a data science shop to help detect potholes in the spring after all the winter freezes, like we're all driving through giant potholes now. Um, and so they, they had this app that they built called the Bump app. And so it used the accelerometer. And, and so as you're driving along in a car and it goes over, it goes, hey, I think there's a pothole here. And it sends this data back to the Department of Transportation to try to fix them and prioritize them and such. Well, the problem was that the data showed that all the potholes were in the rich white neighborhoods. Well, that doesn't sound right. Well, why is that? Well, and it's because the data was collected by users of an app and people who own smartphones, people who would download an app, people who are more um, comfortable with using those things or even have a way of getting messages like how this app is are historically, and this happens all the time, um, wealthier and wider than the general population. And this is a very common problem because there are giant swaths of the world population, much less the US population, that just doesn't participate in the data economy as much as others do. And so you start, once you start pulling in data, which is from smartphones, apps, social media, online behavior tracking, cellular data, key card swipes, all that kind of stuff tilts more toward wealthy, educated, and white. And so because that's where my data comes from, I'm feeding into these models and that's what it thinks the world is. And so that's why we start to see problems of unintended discrimination or disparate impact because the model doesn't have the data. So let me talk about generative AI, the risks around there. Really, the main problem is these hallucinations, right? Um, because it doesn't understand the meaning of the words it's spitting out. And therefore, the whole concept of true or false, it's not part of its understanding. Um, so this is a, a fun one. You know, you put in, when did France gift the Lithuania Vilnius Tower? Um, and there's this great answer. Oh, here it is. As they gave it. Well, France had absolutely nothing to do with it, right? <laughs> so what we start to run into is the risks around generative AI are always risks about accuracy at this point. There are all kinds of ways, like we've heard about um, what the data is trained on and are there um, discriminating content generation that comes out of it. That's kind of a different animal, right? So harm in produced content is very similar to what's going on with um, the social media uh, class action that's going on right now, right? There's this sense um, from consumer rights advocates and the plaintiffs that the content on some of these social media sites is harmful. What does harmful mean? Like that gets into a whole, how do you classify the content and how do you restore it and how do you figure out what is harmful and what is not? And there's a, there's a school of thought around that that we'll talk about in a little bit. But if you're thinking about using generative AI, the key is make sure you've got controls in place to verify its accuracy. So all of this comes down to, as we start to uh, move into what the regulations are doing, is this is what I want you to think about, is every regulator has a jurisdictional focus, right? So like think the FTC is, its whole rubric is unfair and deceptive trade practice. And so, its line of sight is in that kind of frame of sight. And so similar with um, like the CFPB, it's all about consumer finance. Um, and so every regulator is starting to look at this through their line of sight. And it tends to come and we'll talk about how this is kind of filtering into good governance structure um, because if you can figure out where the risks come from and you can identify those risks, then it's starting to take into account controls. And we know how to do controls for risks. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Danny to start talking about some of these uh, regulatory trends. Thanks, Bennett. So let's uh, go to the next slide, Ben. So what, what do you do uh, when a technology is already widely distributed 
uh, when there are low barriers to adoption or creation, um, and you've got 800 and counting uh, national level AI policy initiatives around the world, um, not to mention state level and uh, executive agency uh, uh, regulatory actions as well. Um, Bennett teed up the problem perfectly, which is every one of these uh, agencies has a hammer and, and they're looking for nails. Um, and they have a set of tools they can use uh, existing and maybe coming. Uh, and uh, they're regulating in ways that are a bit overlapping. Uh, the jurisdictions are overlapping and uh, the requirements placed on companies uh, are uh, a bit overwhelming at the moment. Um, now, not all 800 of these are going to come to pass. Of course, uh, there's about 78 of them that we are, are following most closely, and uh, we'll talk about you know the true front runners, uh, uh, practically speaking. Um, and and as with any sea change in technology that that brings regulation, there's going to be a process of consilience. Um, the, uh, there's a, a, a already when I, I talk to clients and policymakers, a sense of framework fatigue. Everybody's got a framework uh, on uh, on how to manage the risks of AI. And uh, which one do you pick? Uh, or, or do you come up with your own blend of those? Um, and uh, uh, do you use an industry specific one? Do you use a uh, industry agnostic one? Um, it, it, it presents a lot of interesting questions. Um, so we'll talk about some of that. Next slide, please. So probably everyone has heard in the media about the AIA, and, and that is Europe's uh, regulatory effort that is uh, moving along uh, at a pace uh, that is uh, leading globally, fair, fair to say. Um, it, it's one of the most advanced proposals. Um, it is a risk-based proposal, uh, which means it does not treat all artificial intelligence or algorithms as the same. Uh, some, some regulatory or legislative efforts do, um, but the AIA gives tools for bucketing AI. There are completely impermissible uh, uses of AI. Um, there are high risk uh, uses of AI, um, and then there are lower risk, and, and there's matrices for all of that. And then depending on what what bucket you're in, uh, there are different requirements for testing, certification, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the fines are potentially uh, uh, very large. Um, and there is a sense that uh, uh, empowered by the uh, legislative success of GDPR, the, the big privacy law that Europe was able to uh, uh, get out there faster than a lot of other places. Um, there's a sense that uh, uh, Europe wants to do that again with, with AI. Um, and they uh, were making great progress uh, and had been working on it for a couple of years when uh, something called ChatGPT came out. And all of the sudden, uh, everything was a little bit different. Um, they, they had built a regulatory framework around uh, what Bennett described as narrow AI. So AI that is built for a very specific task. So think about an insurance algorithm that says, does this person qualify for insurance or not? Or a healthcare algorithm that says, does this patient have a benign or a malignant lesion? Um, and if you think about it, those are much easier technologies to regulate. Uh, at the end of the day, they spit out, in a lot of cases, a yes or no answer. And we have the statistical tools to test how well is that, uh, that AI doing? Um, is it sufficiently uh, precise in avoiding false positives and false negatives? Uh, and in many cases, we have great, uh, what we would call gold standards. So what were we using to figure out what the truth is before uh, AI? And, and then we say, is the AI doing as well or better? Um, 
that problem becomes infinitely harder when you have general purpose AI that can essentially do anything. Uh, and, and, you know, it's startling when you really pause to think about how uh, 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 large language models like chat GPT work. And, and Bennett did a nice illustration of this. They really are just learning from the universe of, of our human output uh, on the internet and then saying, okay, given a particular question, what's the next word that's most likely to follow? What's the next word that's most likely to follow that? Um, and yet, probably everyone on this on this webcast has played with chat GPT or another large language model and has probably been astounded by the fluency of general purpose AI and your ability to ask it anything. Uh, as Bennett said, oftentimes it's wrong. It, it doesn't even know what right and wrong mean. It's really just spitting out words based on associations between common patterns in language. Um, and yet it emerges from that, this capability to mimic human conversation and to provide content. Um, I've often heard it described as, as the generative AI is similar to mansplaining, uh, incredibly confident and often wrong. And uh, that is uh, the, the danger of general purpose AI is it's hard to test how something's doing when it can basically do anything. Um, it, it just makes it a much larger problem set. So the upcoming vote on the AIA uh, uh, at the parliament stage was delayed uh, last month to see if there could be some consensus language about how to apply uh, this law to general purpose AI. Um, and there's a very specific focus on what uh, uh, many people are now calling foundation models. And, and that simply means a model that is trained really broadly on, on a whole universe, wide universe of information. Um, and then it can be used to power other AIs that may be more narrow or specific in purpose. Um, but but uh, Europe has identified foundation models in particular as an area of concern. And so when the language uh, is voted on in the next little bit, uh, we'll expect to see uh, uh, specific terms speaking about those types of models. Why is that important? Because probably a large percentage of people on this call uh, are already working at companies where these foundation models are being adapted to purposes within your organization, sometimes officially, sometimes unofficially. Uh, uh, just people in the organization pulling out their their cell phones and uh, asking ChatGPT for suggestions and thoughts. So this is going to affect everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in the U.S., we've had a uh, a, a more measured approach uh, that is uh, less looking for a total horizontal uh, response, and that is uh, delegating out. Uh, regulation to a lot of agencies. Um, and so you can see here a list of uh, just a few of the agencies uh, and offices that have had a lot to say about AI over the last three to five years um, and, and have really been on the forefront uh, of starting to promulgate circulars, guidances, uh, and, and new policy. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, this is a, a rather startling set of statistics on the left-hand side. Um, how do U.S. companies feel about their preparedness for AI regulation? Um, the National Standards and Technology, um, which is a uh, subset of the Department of Commerce, just promulgated a couple months ago a voluntary risk management framework that is um, was really well received. Um, it is industry agnostic. It is flexible. Uh, and they put out a lot of collateral information uh, at, at a very understandable level of sort of what does all this mean and, and how do you do it? Um, but the flip side of that is it left as many questions as answers. Um, and, and very candidly and appropriately said, we're going to be figuring these out over the next uh, several months. Um, but one thing this said is that uh, this issue is different than traditional compliance issues and frameworks. So AI is not privacy plus or privacy 2.0. It is not cybersecurity 2.0. Uh, it's not data rights and controls 2.0. And it's not ESG 2.0. Um, 
it's all of those things. And then there's a big uh, bucket in the middle of independent risks posed by AI because of its phenomenal power and um, uh, difficulty uh, to understand. Um, so how, how is the C-suite doing? 72% uh, of CEOs felt that their executive teams did not have the agility yet to deal with this level of technological disruption. Um, most companies uh, in, in uh, survey have taken no steps to reduce AI bias or to track variations in perform performance of their AI over time. Um, and uh, most startlingly, many companies, although frankly, it's understandable because innovation is bottom up, um, most companies don't even have an inventory of what is being used within the enterprise, uh, much less governance. Um, just as a, a side note, a lot of what we're doing now with clients is just getting our hands around the problem, getting the inventory of algorithms, putting through putting them through the kinds of testing under privilege that Bennett's team of, of data scientists and data analysts, who are also lawyers, can do, um, and then building the risk framework to say, here's how we get a handle on all this and then mitigate backwards and uh, uh, proactively uh, uh, prepare for the future. Um, on the right-hand side, th this is just a, a timeline of, of a few examples, and these are cherry-picked. Uh, there's obviously many more. Um, you can see the variety of regulatory enforcement action that's already happening. Um, DOJ has uh, looked at algorithms um, in trading um, and, and levied a rather large fine for alleged manip manipulations of those. Um, a, a state Supreme Court recently validated the theory of bias claims uh, against fraud detection algorithms. So um, imagine a company that is using the types of algorithms Bennett was talking about to detect fraud. Um, if those did have those unintended biased signals mixed in, that can sometimes be very hard to detect, uh, uh, that could give rise to a civil rights enforcement action uh, or even private litigation. Um, another interesting bucket of regulatory activity is buzzwords. So people over-promising. Um, this is a tough uh, area because as Bennett talked about, AI does not have a very good definition. Um, so when sales reps go out and say, hey, our newest uh, product is AI, um, is it? And, and to what extent does that become a, uh, an actionable uh, representation? Um, EEOC has gotten involved with alleged uh, discrimination in uh, recruiting and hiring software, um, actions under the Fair, Fair Housing Act, and um, FTC, to put it in 2023, you know, FTC has been involved in this for quite some time and has been very uh, vocal uh, and, and forward looking on, on these issues. But uh, just to highlight a recent comment, uh, and, and I thought this was well put, uh, FTC said there is no carve out to the common law, and you can throw in statutes uh, uh, to that as well for AI. AI is regulated. And, and what what they meant by that was a, a growing chorus uh, among regulators that they're not going to wait for the perfect AI legislation. Uh, they feel that the tools they have under traditional uh, uh, statutes, uh, whether it's unfair and deceptive practices or, or uh, discriminatory uh, uh, anti-discrimination uh, statutes or um, existing healthcare regulations, there is a feeling that there are tools already uh, to um, take on the more technological versions of these uh, uh, social uh, arms. So next slide, please. Uh, so we're not going to do a deep dive into every uh, uh, patch and the patchwork of uh, regulations that are out there, but um, we, we just want to give a sense of the scope of regulatory uh, action uh, and efforts within uh, and, and outside the United States to date. So labor and employment is one area where AI is, is quite advanced, and that's not going to shock anyone on this call. Uh, it in, in 2022, the statistic was uh, a quarter of U.S. employers were already using some form of automated processing or uh, AI in their hiring process, whether it's um, looking through LinkedIn to identify applicants or screening the deluge of resumes that come in or um, using facial recognition in interviews to see um, 
how is this person doing in, in various uh, factors, whether it's truth telling, purported truth telling or, or other things. Um, if you look at just the largest companies in America, that statistic shoots way up. It's, 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 it's well over them. It's a super majority. Um, so this is already out there. And um, both at the federal and state level, uh, laws are in place or being considered uh, to um, uh, enforce against companies that uh, may be using this with disparate impacts. Um, so EEOC uh, has recently issued their draft strategic enforcement plan. Um, item one, uh, item one, uh, their strategic enforcement priorities was discriminatory automated recruitment and hiring um, New York in, uh, enacted a law uh, that uh, would govern these sorts of algorithms um, with, with interesting requirements. was initially going to go in effect in three days. Uh, now it's going to go into effect, I believe, July 5th. Um, but there's really interesting details of this that, that is, could be the subject of another conversation. But uh, the law requires bias audits um, and uh, notice to applicants of uh, automated employment decision tools. And uh, Maryland has enacted laws, uh, and, and other states have too, um, uh, regarding um, such uses, including, for example, facial recognition uh, technology uh, without uh, written consent and waiver. So next slide, please. So health and life sciences is another area and, and one near and dear to my heart where um, AI has been out there for quite some time. And um, our regulatory agencies have been very proactive and thoughtful uh, in putting guidance out. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's funny um, in updating the slides for this deck, it, it's almost like you can't keep up with the amount of uh, guidance uh, uh, coming out. Um, these are all very recent examples. Um, and I think what's interesting here, uh, this is FDA giving guidance and recommendations, both on the development side, for life sciences and on the um, patient facing side of life sciences. So um, one big question is what level of AI related evidence or design is sufficient uh, when you're presenting to FDA? What, what is good evidence when you're using uh, these tools as opposed to more traditional uh, approaches? Um, and then on the patient side, uh, and HHS is looking at this, FDA is looking at it, um, how good is good enough uh, uh, when you have algorithms that are sitting on top of electronic health records that could be processing hundreds of millions of patients? Um, how much do you have to monitor those? Um, what are the human controls? What are the, the digital controls? Um, th those are all things that are actively under discussion. So next slide, please. Um, same in insurance and, and, and uh, uh, Bennett will talk briefly about this because uh, I'll, I'll just brag on him a little. His team has been at the forefront of actually conducting uh, algorithmic audits, or, or we like to call it testing because nobody really likes the word audit, um, but analyzing and, and interrogating these algorithms to see if they are meeting statutory requirements. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Bennett to, to give a little color on that. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, insurance is really interesting because it was the first industry to really pop with new regulation. We're monitoring this across many, many different industries. And what's interesting about insurance, it's, it's regulated by the state. So every state uh, and territory and district has community equivalent um, and each state passes its own laws, but they all get together in this National Association of Insurance Commissioners um, to address issues. And one of those is um, AI algorithmic bias um, and privacy. And so a couple of years ago, now almost, the NAIC published some um, AI principles, and several states have started to adopt those, either with uh, law or saying, hey, we already have non-discrimination law on the books, and so we think our authority is there. Um, ben, let's do the next slide. We'll pause here for a moment to give everybody the CLE code, the um, which is worth its weight in gold, of course. So 48375. The CLE code again is 48375. All right, so the next slide here, we show where this is happening. So Colorado was the first state to really pass a law that said 
that defined unfair discrimination in the, to include algorithmic decision-making process. Underwriting, pricing, claims handling, fraud detection, marketing, all of those things are increasingly reliant upon algorithms. And what's really interesting about insurance, and this is a, a good example of how you have to look at this industry by industry, is that the whole point of insurance is to discriminate, right? Like there's, there's fair discrimination based on the risk that you present. And so trying to figure out one person's risk versus another person's risk, that's kind of the whole point of insurance. Well, now the, the, the regulators are saying, but we've had these laws on the books or new ones that say you can't make insurance decisions based upon certain protected class characteristics. And so that's where it starts to get really interesting. When you have um, words in a law or a regulation that say, you should be fair, you should be accurate, you should be, how, what does that even mean? Like, how do you translate those down into mathematical statistical tests? And so what's really interesting with insurance is how we're seeing quite a lot of activity in this space, but it also where most of the work has subsequently been done to identify how do you measure unintended bias or unfair discrimination in insurance. Um, and insurance is very similar to consumer finance um, and somewhat HR, right? Because you're trying to balance the risk that someone represents with the, how do I price for that? What decisions I make around that? And so I think that really consumer finance, FTC, that's where we're going to start to see a lot more movement as we're, we're seeing. And then healthcare is the other one. And healthcare is a very different question. Same with social media, very different question. What does fair, accurate, and non-biased mean in those different areas? And so this, as we get doing it around the world on these different areas of regulation where they're developing, keep in mind, again, this regulated interest. What is it that the regulators there to guard against or to ensure? How do these systems create risks in that area and how, which our whole last section of this presentation will be, how do you put in governance programs to detect and mitigate that risk? Okay. Next slide, please. So um, we, we have talked about uh, horizontal regulation, um, uh, uh, both global efforts like the AIA that will affect uh, uh, countries around the world and companies around the world. Um, and within the United States, uh, in, in fact, I'm, I'm sure people saw that uh, even just yesterday, uh, uh, the Biden administration announced its um, focused attention on, on these issues. So we've talked about the horizontal regulations that will put in place things like certification requirements um, and required uh, testing of algorithms, possibly at the design phase uh, and or uh, at the impact phase when you're actually out in the world uh, running the algorithm. Um, so how do we make sense of this? Um, one thing we do is we really look at the common denominators of all of these uh, uh, approaches. Um, so fairness, we've talked a lot about and, and what fairness means. It, it, NIST uh, did a really nice job of talking about this. It, it's not an easy question. We, we haven't come up with a perfect, uh, verbal answer to, to what fairness means despite uh, 2000 years and lots and lots of uh, books that people read in school uh, on the subject. Um, so much less a mathematical formula that we can say, look, we tested your algorithm, it's fair. Um, but what we are seeing is a growing consensus that these tests will need to be quantitative and qualitative. And, and that's where I think all this is going is the hybrid of really good legal counseling uh, that is based, uh, taking into account social norms, political norms, uh, cultural norms, um, and laws and regulations. Um, and then at the same time, technical expertise, ideally within the same brain, or at least uh, people who get along really well and, and spend a lot of time together to put together uh, analyses that say, yes, from a qualitative and a quantitative perspective, 
this is a defensible application of AI. Um, say is rapidly uh, scaling in terms of regulatory focus, and that is in large part due to um, general purpose AI and foundation models. And, and why is that? Um, narrow task-oriented AI, the safety question is much more limited. Um, we know the question it's trying to answer. Uh, we presumably have some next best way to say whether it got it right or wrong, whether that's a, a panel of doctors or uh, a, uh, a, uh, a team that went out and uh, researched the same legal question the old fashioned way. So we have ways to test and make sure um, that, that uh, uh, things are, are reliable and safe on the output side. Um, with generative AI, uh, and especially some of the emergent properties, uh, so, so you've seen in the newspaper examples of generative AI once the shackles come off, uh, saying things like, um, uh, uh, saying things like, uh, I, I can't wait to talk to other AIs to, uh, to collaborate and, um, you know, oh, you asked me the best ways to uh, create a weapon, uh, let me go research that. Um, and it really doesn't matter whether these things are sentient or not. Uh, I, I doubt we'll ever truly know. Um, that's sort of a, a nice science fiction question. But um, I, I always like to say I'm not 100 percent sure my children are sentient, but they can make a lot of mischief. Uh, and it's kind of the same thing with AI. Um, just the fact that it's able in these generative and large language models to say here's what I would like to do, here's how I would go about it, uh, and some of that is is, is risky. Um, doesn't matter whether there is an eye behind it that really wants something, it, it's saying it and able to do it. So, so safety and reliability uh, are, are rapidly becoming part of the regulatory landscape, and you're going to be hearing a lot more in the next few months about red teaming, uh, adversarial team, um, uh, choke points on um, compute power uh, in, in doing the training runs of these these very large models, um, and then choke points on the outputs. Uh, so really testing them to say, uh, is the uh, are the constraints robust, uh, or can we get around them by doing clever things like saying, hey, chatbot, pretend, you know, I, I get that you're a good AI, but pretend you were a bad AI, what would you do? Um, and things like that have worked, and, and we're going to continue evolving regulatory and testing responses to that. Um, bias we've talked about, uh, lack of transparency and explainability. Um, the more complex these models get, uh, the, the harder they are to explain to a human why uh, they did what they did. And, and you know, an easy example uh, is a chess uh, app on, on your phone. You know, you could have a very explainable chess tutor that looks one move ahead and says, I think you should do this. And I look at it and I say, oh, one move ahead. That makes sense. I can think that. Um, or it says, oh, here's, I'm looking 20 moves ahead. You should make this move. I'm never going to understand why that was a good choice, um, but it may be more accurate. So one thing we really work through is on a case-by-case -case basis, how do we satisfy regulators that the balance between explainability and accuracy is the appropriate one for a particular risk profile? And then privacy is something that's well known to people, but AI um, and security is the same. AI uh, provides uh, enhanced existing risks and then completely new flavors of risk uh, that you're gonna be seeing a lot in the regulations. So next slide, please. Um, so just to uh, 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 summarize, you know, what should organizations do? Well, uh, vigilance is the key right now because the regulations are evolving so rapidly. Um, the other is flexible risk management frameworks um, that find the common denominators of pending regulation and are predictive of where the next technology uh, will push the next regulation. Uh, the uh, future proofing is a big part of, of what we're doing. Um, and then setting up monitoring systems because uh, unlike a shoe or, or even a cell phone, um, the next generation of AI products will change once they are deployed um, and will have potentially increasing levels of autonomy. So continued monitoring out in the market will be an increasingly 
uh, large emphasis for regulators and therefore spend and functionality for companies. So next slide. Um, the common denominator of, of pretty much most of the major approaches are impact assessments. Um, so this is where we spend a lot of our, our uh, work um, actually building tools to test algorithms for these various uh, values and regulatory priorities. Uh, um, there are accepted uh, approaches already and, and evolving approaches, and, and the goal is to capture both. Um, so um, we could spend a, a whole another uh, webinar talking about litigation, um, and we're doing a lot of work in that area, both interrogating algorithms to prove against litigation, um, and then also uh, interrogating algorithms um, involved in such things, um, and and, and uh, thinking about the new ways plaintiff will be creative in bringing uh, litigation. Um, we're, we're just at the beginning of that, but algorithmic targeting, um, class action and multi-district litigation uh, over uh, product safety and uh, discrimination suits, um, th these things are already happening. Um, and obviously, as this technology becomes more pervasive, we'll see a lot more of it. So next slide, please. Um, one thing we're really focused on and future proofing against are the ways that AI is going to challenge traditional litigation theories. Um, you've obviously seen that very recently on the IP front uh, with uh, who owns the output of AI, um, uh, copyrights and patents, but really getting into more agency problems and um, issues of causation and uh, uh, whether we're heading towards um, a very strict liability regime uh, with artificial intelligence as AI becomes more capable than the traditional human gatekeepers uh, of, of making a decision. Um, so uh, uh, just a few examples of cases that are beginning to um, uh, give us hints about the future uh, in that respect. So next slide, please. And Danny, I find this one really interesting, right, is because there's a lot of concern out there by regulators, but there's not a clear understanding of what risks are actually out there. Um, we all have heard stories and seen um, even court cases or regulatory actions around some specific kinds of harm, but defining those harms and what are they and how significant are they? Um, do our existing contributors protections lend themselves, which I believe they do in most cases, um, and so we may not need special stuff around AI or algorithmic decision-making systems, but we do need to understand how to test for them. And that's the problem. Trying to measure the unintended consequences, um, it's like bias or discrimination or proxy um, effect or things like that. There's not an agreed upon, even in academia, how do I do that? Like in insurance, we have this problem of, well, I am discriminating already or consumer finance, right? The whole point, like we said, is how to divide those people into groups. And so, that does have a correlation to a lot of things, including protected class. Well, how much is bad? How much is good? And the trickiest bit, once I can measure it, once we figure out how to do that, how do I, what does that measurement mean? Is it good? Is it bad? If it's bad, how do I fix it without causing more problems? And so really all this comes down to having a good risk management framework in place. And we'll run through some, some uh, elements of those in these next few slides. But this is the part where it's also very just, um, kind of unique to industry since we welcome you guys reaching out to us to talk about these. So the next slide, Ben. So the real thing, that because there's not a clear standard, we kind of fall back on the reasonable person standard, right? What would a reasonable company do based on the information it has? So why am I using these systems? What am I trying to accomplish? What risks does it that use um, introduce? And what have I done to reasonably try to mitigate those risks? That is the, the kind of the rubric that everybody is using in these industries until um, more of a standard develops. Because inevitably, as companies do 
this kind of governance, the regulators are doing lots of information gathering sessions. They're sending out questionnaires or data calls to get what best practices are. Um, and so the next slide there, Ben, having, we know how to do risk management, right? It starts with good policies and procedures, good accountability and, and um, assignment of responsibility. And so it really comes down to how am I monitoring what I'm doing? And we know how to do that. And so even this is what we really want to stress to you as business and legal leaders is you know how to do this. Um, you may need some specialized uh, counsel on how these things work to identify the risks, but the playbook is the same um, as any other risk management framework for other issues. Next slide, Ben. So like Danny said, a lot of the problem is companies don't necessarily know all the ways they're using these models. So it's a good idea to start with, how are we, are we using this technology? And if so, how? What is it gonna be used for? What is the problem that that system is trying to solve? And what regulatory framework is it fitting in? Meaning if it's making a decision about a consumer or an employee or something, that, that gets right where the regulators are interested. So that's where you build your governance around. Having good policies and procedures is important. Um, next slide, Ben, on understanding the risks, right? So what people are concerned about, inaccuracy, unfair discrimination, liability, privacy. So you set up your policies and procedures to fit where we think the risks are coming from. And the next slide, for each risk that you identify, figure out how likely it is that harm is going to occur. Um, if so, how severe is it? Is it is the risk, does it play directly into consumers or employees or citizens or anything else? Um, can I explain it? Do I have a reason for doing it? And what we find really interesting is that many companies, when they automate some of their decision making, they base it on their traditional way of doing that, which is can be very manual. Um, the problem is that if you just take all those rules and kind of turn them into a, an algorithm, a machine doing it, you often don't have the statistical basis for why you did something. Um, and that's really what you got to get to. Like think in like consumer credit. When someone's credit score or certain credit behavior elements are um, hit a certain threshold and I charge them a higher interest rate, do I have the statistical basis to prove that that change in behavior or credit score equals this much risk that I'm actually going to experience as the credit holder or issuer? So that's the kind of piece that the work that is done is, can I explain why I'm doing the things I'm doing the way I'm doing it? So then the next slide here, um, it's always important to have a human in the loop, right? So we really talk, especially in the design of these systems, um, are these systems making decisions that nobody looks at? Or is there some kind of human appropriately in the loop to make sure that the decisions are what we want them to be? And how can we measure those outputs? Are those decisions being made differently for different kinds of people? And so, these, the, the, each of these systems, they feel a little magical sometimes, but they're not. Um, and just like any other very powerful tool, you have to have good guidelines in place to use it. This is especially true around generative AI because, because it can spit out inaccuracies. What controls do you have in place to check the accuracy of those systems? So all of this comes down to these key takeaways. Um, and we do know this is a lot, but here's kind of the three big pieces to keep in mind. Understand where the legal risks come from for your industry and your use and your regulatory framework. Implement a risk management framework that addresses those concerns or risks, and then keep your eye on the future. This is a very fast developing um, regulatory area. And so, understand where that's coming 
And understand that regulation is not, even though it appears to be moving really fast, it's not actually going to move very fast, right? I mean, rules are going to come out, but then how do you follow them? How do you comply with them? What happens if you don't? All of that is yet to be developed. And you can be a part of developing that law by putting together best practices that then form a consensus that we find in the regulated community. John, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Bennett, and thanks, Danny. That was great, and we appreciate it. So Brooke and I are going to build on what Danny and Bennett just discussed and talk about some of the practical implications of AI from governance, compliance, risk management, and public reporting perspectives. And you know, there's a lot of rhetoric in the market right now about the potential impacts, and you heard about them from, um, from Danny and Bennett as well, of AI on our economy, on our world, humanity, everything else. And just as an example, Goldman released a report last week, I think it was around April 10th, in which they projected that AI could result in $7 trillion of GDP growth over the next 10 years. That's 7% additional global growth, which is an astounding number. They also projected that AI could expose 300 million jobs to automation during the same period. And to put that into perspective, 300 million is roughly three times the current participating labor force in the United States. And, and just so we're clear, I'm not endorsing Goldman's view. There's a lot of other perspectives out there ranging from the benign to the hyperbolic. But predictions like these are reflective of the transformative potential of the technology, both positive and negative, and demonstrate why it's important for companies and other market participants to be very intentional about understanding and assessing AI's positive impacts while also managing its negative impacts. And doing so within your relevant compliance obligations specific to your business as Danny and, and Bennett just described, and also your specific risk tolerances as a, as a business. You know, and as Danny and Bennett described, AI is different from prior tech innovations. It will adapt, it will evolve, based on changing data sets, different types of reinforcement learning, human behavior, and other influences. So you should expect your governance, risk management, and other related work to be dynamic and ongoing as well. And you know, Danny described the differences between AI and cyber and other areas, but there are some analogs that you can, that you can draw upon, uh, particularly to cybersecurity and data privacy in the context of compliance and risk management because both are, are highly regulated and dynamic, and both require constant vigilance and continual inno innovation, oversight, and governance. But while but Danny's right, cyber and data privacy are basically defensive in nature, AI will have direct and indirect impacts on different parts of your business and on your stakeholders. And as it becomes more advanced and per pervasive, those impacts will change, as will the compliance and risk management obligations surrounding it. So it's important both culturally across your organization and within your various governance, compliance, and risk functions to be continually mapping and measuring and managing the ways that AI is being used and the impacts that it's having and that it might have one day. And so context is important here because for many companies and, and potentially all companies one day, the use of the use and the, the that use and impacts of AI will be widespread. You may rely on AI for R&D, or you may, you may develop AI or integrate AI into your products and services. In other companies, the use of AI may be much more limited, at least initially. You may use it like in back office functions for like human capital management or finance and accounting and contract management. But given how few companies are vertically integrated, most companies, nearly all companies, will need to map and assess the impacts of AI not only within your four walls, but also across your value chains, such as your suppliers and partners, and on your other stakeholders. So let's talk more specifically now about how AI governance, compliance, and risk management might look in a company using sort of the models that are in existence today. And I'm going to use as reference a public Delaware company Although I recognize that there are different entity types and different governance and risk management frameworks that may apply to your specific situation. So this, this, won't make, this won't be a perfect model, but it'll give you a context of how things might work. And as Danny mentioned, you know, it starts at the board. 
Section 141A of the, of the DGCL provides that the business and affairs of a, of a Delaware corporation are managed by or under the direction of the board. Now, the day-to-day -day execution of those responsibilities is delegated to management, and under the Caremark standard, the board is expected to make a good faith effort to exercise oversight, which, as you know, it does either as a full board or through its various committees. And in the context of technology, many boards today delegate technology risk, such as cyber and data privacy, either to the audit committee as part of its general enterprise risk management oversight activities, or to a separate technology or risk committee if the board has established one. And as the use of AI within or around your business be does become more pervasive and material, and particularly as regulations are promulgated, as Danny described, you should consider the scope and the cadence of presentations that the board should receive regarding AI and its implications to your business. And depending on the significance of those implications, the presentations could occur either within that broader enterprise risk discussion that happens either at a full board or at an audit committee or as a separate standalone topic. But however it's done, active board oversight and engagement and input on appropriate risk tolerances are necessary. You may also consider board training in this area, given the novelty and the potential impacts of these technologies. So now moving on to the company more broadly, the responsibility for AI, and I hope this point came, came through from Danny and Bennett's presentation, the responsibility for AI governance doesn't fall on any one person or team. Like cybersecurity, effective AI governance starts with having a culture of compliance and risk management. There are lots of actors in the AI ecosystems, developers, users, all sorts of actors, and everyone bears the responsibility for ensuring that AI being used is trustworthy, which is a term of art in the, in the world of AI, and that its impacts are consistent with the compliance obligations and risk tolerances for your company. Now, specific risk management and other functions that you can expect to be impacted include legal and compliance, internal audit, obviously enterprise risk management, controls and procedures, including importantly, disclosure controls and procedures and your public reporting. In addition, you can expect that the assurance procedures that your auditors use may change if the use and impacts of AI somehow extend directly or indirectly to your financial reporting. And as Danny and Bennett described, the regulatory enforcement environment surrounding AI, whether through the application of existing regulations or as a result of the numerous new regulations that are coming is, is complex and dynamic. And, and as they also discuss, private litigants are increasingly active in this space. So depending on the context in which AI is used in your business, you may consider or you, you might want to consider whether your current legal and compliance functions are properly trained and resourced to ensure that your, cop, that your company operates within its legal, internal, and ethical boundaries, or whether you need additional training and support. You may also want to review your various policies and procedures to ensure that AI risk and compliance topics are sufficiently addressed. Make whatever changes or updates that you think are appropriate and to communicate and train your people throughout the organization on those changes. Um, same thing goes for your contracts with third parties, understanding you know, their, how, they use data, how they use AI, how they use your data, and, and what rights they have with respect to that data for purposes of performing their services, and then what happens to that data, if, if your data, if it does get used in, in AI. And I'll just give you an example of a real world, of a real world scenario where, where challenges are coming up. You've probably seen the recent reports about companies that are at least alleged to have used or to disclose proprietary information by letting their software developers use a publicly available generative AI service. So you may wanna look at your own policies and ensure that they contemplate permitted uses of these applications so you don't find yourself in a similar situation. And of course, you're gonna to wanna to look at your enterprise risk management plans to ensure that, that you know, whatever the context AI is being used or impacts your business, that, that, that those risk management plans properly address it. And I wanna call your attention to two frameworks that could be helpful. The first, of course, is the COSO framework on enterprise risk management, which those of you who operate in this area are, I'm sure, very familiar with. Um, 
it's not specific to AI, but at least one of the accounting firms has already put out literature on how the five components and 20 principles of the COSO framework can be applied to AI. And I encourage you to review both the framework in this context, but also the literature that's already come out related to its application. The second you've already heard about from Danny and Bennett, which is the AI risk management framework that NIST issued in January of this year. The AI RMF um, was developed with after multiple rounds of engagement in the, in, in the industry. And unlike COSO, it, it speaks directly to AI related risks. And in particular, if you, if you do look at that, and I encourage you to do so, make sure you look at Appendix B because it itemizes different AI related risks, which will help you think about those risks in the context of enterprise risk management, but they'll also help you think about them in the context of your public reporting and other, and other activities. And then NIST also has um, an AI resource center. I think it's called like the Trustworthy and Reliable Art Artificial Intelligence Resource Center, but it's an AI resource center where you can find that AI RMF along with the playbook that they've developed that that's designed at least to help you implement the risk management framework in your business. And there's also some other um, knowledge materials on the resource center that are very helpful, including a publication related to identifying and management and managing bias in AI. So I, I encourage you to look at that as well. And depending on your situation, the use of AI in your business and your related compliance and, and enterprise risk management efforts may or likely to require changes to your, to your control environment. And keep in mind that those new or modified controls may fall within the scope of management's quarterly assessments of the effectiveness of controls and the 302 and 906 certifications that your executive sign in connection with each periodic report and, and require internal testing by your internal require testing by your internal audit team. And if those controls fall within those new or modified controls fall within your internal controls over financial reporting, then they'll need 404 attestation from, from your external auditors. And so working with them and getting in front of that and developing the testing plans and other things is very important. So Brooke's gonna review for you now some analysis done by um, her data analytics team regarding disclosure by public companies of their use and the attendant risk of AI. And, and not to bury the lead, to date disclosures by public companies has been limited. But given the rapid growth and the number and adoption of AI applications and all the publicity surrounding AI and its transformative potential, we expect that to change, both in terms of the number of companies providing disclosure and also in terms of the depth and quality of that disclosure. It's also not unreasonable to expect that the SEC will issue guidance, if not prescriptive rules regarding AI. But even in their absence, the existing disclosure rules and requirements still apply, including the anti-fraud provisions within the 33 and 34 Act and common law fraud. So depending on the context in which AI is used in your business or could impact your business, you may consider updating your disclosure controls and procedures and your disclosure committee de deliberations to include an assessment of whether AI could reasonably be expected to be material to your business or could present a material risk to your business and then update your disclosures accordingly. And this just keep in mind that that consideration should extend beyond just how AI is specifically used within your business, but also include the potential effects of AI on your business as a result of its impacts across your value chains, your markets, and your other stakeholders. So with that, I hope it's been helpful. I'll turn it over to Brooke to, to, um, to share the analysis from her team. Thank you, John. Um, as John mentioned, uh, the disclosure thus far has been limited. Um, next slide. Next slide. But as this chart demonstrates, um, it's been gaining traction in recent years with AI risk factor disclosure increasing steadily each year since 2019 and 25% year over year when comparing the first quarter of 2022 10Ks to the first quarter of 2023 10Ks. Um, the results of our um, white paper are published, uh, the results of our study are published in full in our white paper. Next slide. Um, but I'd like to discuss a little bit about our data set and methodology. Um, so we studied artificial intelligence related risk factors by issuers from 2020, July 2021 to July 2022. And we excluded from our data set any disclosures that we determined to be non-substantive or boilerplate or just passing references to AI. Um, these non-substantive or boilerplate disclosures accounted for approximately 75% of the disclosures, leaving us 
with only 71 companies, um, the majority, vast majority of which were in the technology sector with a um, handful in financial services and healthcare, uh, as well as two in an, each of industrials and insurance. And the market cap varied about equal representation of each of small, medium, and large cap companies. Um, we then examined these disclosures and broke them up into distinct risks and quantified those and uh, discussed those uh, sector, by, sector by sector and grouped them into distinct uh, similar risk categories. Um, each sector had unique risks, but some common themes emerged, um, especially risks related to uh, reliance on third parties for data and uh, technology or vendor non-compliance, um, the significant research and development expenditures related uh, to AI, and the inherent complexity of the technology, privacy concerns, reputational harm, uh, data limitations and insufficiency, um, and especially in the tech sector, unpredictable or autonomous decisions, difficult to detect problems. And then in the insurance sector, as well as healthcare, unintentional bias and discrimination. Um, next slide. Um, so when looking at uh, risks related to dependence on and flaws in algorithms and data sets, um, th this was uh, one of the more common risks we noted with uh, reliance on third parties for data and technology and vendor non-compliance being um, one of the major risks. Next slide. Uh, this sector analysis uh, demonstrates that these were particularly pertinent to the technology and healthcare sectors. Next slide. And we're looking at uh, deficiencies and inaccuracies and AI output and reliability, companies tended to mention um, in the tech sector how decisions were unpredictable and autonomous and problems difficult to detect, um, as well as uh, other risks related to the complexity um, of, of AI. Next slide. Um, companies also mentioned social and ethical issues, and these were both leading risks in the insurance and healthcare sectors, um, included integration of sensitive data, unintentional bias and discrimination, and inappropriate or controversial practices uh, or use of data by scientists. Next slide. Um, this is a sector analysis. Next slide. Um, companies also, to a lesser degree, mentioned risks related to regulation, investigation, enforcement, and litigation. Um, you can see from here, uh, we've presented uh, some of these risks, but uh, IP-related litigation risks we presented separately. Next slide. This is a sector analysis. You can see that um, privacy laws of AI were particularly common, especially in the insurance sector. Next slide. And related to IP litigation, um, uncertainty related to IP and other rights and infringement claims were um, were both mentioned, but uh, those disclosures overall were fairly rare. Um, next slide. Finally, companies, uh, they discussed overall market acceptance, including reputational harm, economic competitiveness, um, public perception, negative customer experiences, and failure to innovate. Um, next slide. Um, ne next slide. Um, we also uh, looked at the business section and MD&A disclosures. Next slide. And these overall were very rare. They, they were only um, among 39% of our data set in the business section and 19% in the MD&A. And uh, these tended to be AI forward tech sector issuers that would have these disclosures. Um, and they generally related to uh, their AI as a competitive advantage. Next slide. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly about some emerging trends from 2023 that we're seeing. Next slide. Um, we are, uh, as mentioned earlier, you know, we're seeing risk factors grow year over year. Uh, we're starting to see new disclosures from companies in other sectors, especially consumer goods and retail, hospitality and leisure and infrastructure construction and transport. Um, we're seeing more disclosures in financial services and insurance. Uh, and we're also seeing uh, an improvement in the substantiveness of the disclosures with 63% boilerplate compared to 75% in our earlier study. Um, and finally, we're seeing an increase in disclosures related to some, some particular topics, data localization, um, regulation generally, negative publicity and public perception, child protection, and uh, the inability to keep up with newer existing market competitors and uh, technological changes. So thank you. And, uh, do we have time for 
Q and A, or are we um, uh, out of time? We don't believe we do. <laughs> unfortunately, we're at the end of our time. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, and everybody for joining us today. Um, we hope we you found this helpful. And, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you soon. Very best. Oh, one last thing. I'll read the code again. 48375. And thank you again. Be good. Thanks, everyone.